Hey there, people of Earth. Evan Benson of evdogfromair.com here. I'm new to this whole video making thing, so I'm going to try a new approach with this one. Uh, more of a video diary kind of a feel. Um, something happened to me on the Facebook of all places. A friend and I got in a little spat, and I wanted to address it. Uh, it I'm kind of over it, so the sense of urgency has passed, and I'm going to apologize for that, and I'm going to hope that some people just get something out, out of this, a little entertaining, something thought-provoking, hopefully. So, a friend of mine posted on his Facebook page this Vox article called Seven Psychological Concepts That Explain the Trump Era of Politics. And I took a look at it, I tried to uh, get through it, and it was just, it was caca. It was terrible. It was just the whole, this whole thing in pol or in, a, sorry, in psychology of people are just the product of their environment, you know, we're all just animals, and this is all... It was, it was very bad, from my perspective as someone who studied the history of psychology and the history of these various institutions, I really, you know, was disappointed. And I made a comment on his page, which was puerile, let's say. I said to him, hey, you know, the editor of Vox, Edward Klein, he's only 34, which is close to him and my ages. If only you had agreed to pose for, like, nude photos, let's say, or get yourself caught in bed with a three-year-old, maybe you could be the editor of such a website by now. Uh, so he deleted my comment, and he sent me a well-worded uh, private message, which is the right way to do things, I think. You know, saying, hey, your comment does not add to the discussion. He said that it could be taken as a right-wing screed, and he thought that I had some problem with Vox. Uh, and I was basically like, Zuh. Like, I personally don't know anything about Vox. I've studied the media, I've studied the history of the control of media by intelligence agencies and other kinds of groups throughout history. Uh, Vox is, I know they're kind of a big player, but I really didn't know very much about them. So I replied, Hey, I'm sorry, you know, it won't happen again. I was disappointed, uh, and I had this notion that we were basically not interested in having the same conversation, and I'm going to get into that in a little bit. So, but after that, you know, it, I, I thought about it for about an hour. Uh, I, you know, at some point later in the day, I decided, hey, I really like to learn things, so I'm just going to Google, like, CIA and Vox or something like this. And so I came up with a really interesting series of articles by a website called FAIR.org, where they've taken the time of going and researching the ties that Vox in particular has to companies like Comcast and the CIA, of course, and that they're not uh, disclosing you know, these, these links, which hurts the credibility of, of what they're trying to say, nonetheless. Uh, so I found this, I thought, you know, I'm kind of, I don't think this is going to go over well with this particular friend of mine, but, you know, he's a friend. So I wanted to do what I thought was the right thing. I wanted to share this, and I, and I started to think, like, how can I, uh, you know, say something that's going to bridge, that's going to, you know, segue into him reading this material. So I thought, you know, it's part of his criticism of what I said was that I wasn't, addressing his original uh, posting, you know, the content of this article in question, I said, okay, well, I'll do that. I'll, I'll read the article, because one particular point, uh, you know, did stick out of me, and I said, okay, I can go into this, and I can read what, what this particular article is saying about this point, and I can address it. So I did that. I went and checked out this article. I went to the one particular point that had interested me, and I clicked through the links that were provided, and wouldn't you know it, woozles! The links that were provided were links to other Vox articles. So, for those who don't know, there's something called the woozle effect, which is basically a redirect to your own 
uh, material as a source. So they've done this, uh, you know, in academia for years and years and years, I'm sure, but in this, uh, you know, internet era where you can just put a little hyperlink there, it's much more prevalent. Um, so for example, this would be like if I was making a video and I was saying, you know, as a citation, here is uh, Evdog, PhD in anthropology and what he has to say, and I would—I mean, that would be ridiculous. No, that's so. I mean, you know, regardless of the comment or sorry, the content not being good, it was just impossible to take it seriously because there's woozles, woozles everywhere. So uh, I got pretty discouraged, and I just kind of realized I was gonna have to say, okay, uh, all right, bye. I'm sorry. I mean, that's—I don't—that was rude. I'm sorry. I realized that I would just have to excuse myself from this particular conversation and I started to think about how I could do that, you know. So, you know, I said that. I said, all right, I'm not going to engage in this anymore. And I just said, here are a couple of, you know, instances when psychology has basically been defrauded. So I, I brought up the Stanford Prison experiment. If you don't know about that, basically one of the uh, participants from Wikipedia I just learned researching this, he was actually mimicking one of the characters from Cool Hand Luke, which is a pr prison movie. Uh, so the, the, the re results were useless, and yet Philip Zimbardo, who conducted this experiment, he became the American Psychological Association president in 2002. So some big institutional ties there uh, that are, you know, indisputable. I also mentioned the Kinsey reports, and uh, Kinsey reports, this guy was, this guy was a pedophile. Alfred Kinsey was a pedophile. Um, he had ties to a widespread pedophile ring that he was using to source his data, and people he, he, he said that he couldn't disclose the identity of these pedophiles because then he would be cut off from these, from the data. So that's, and the Alfred Kinsey, it was mentioned in the, in the inaugural issue of Playboy magazine in 1953, interestingly enough. Uh, but, you know, nevertheless, this is the scientific basis for sex ed in this country. It's also the scientific basis for uh, the sexual revolution. Um, and I'm not going to get into that, but it's, this is ridiculous stuff that we're all kind of pinning our, I don't know, if you're a leftist, you're basically pinning your hopes and dreams on. If you're a progressive, you're saying, here's proof of progress, and it's all garbage. So I wanted to conclude with saying that we're not having the same conversation, specifically my friend is attempting to have a philosophical conversation, and I'm attempting to have a historical conversation. So philosophy is very, very important. I love it. I love to read uh, philosophy. I haven't for a long time because I've been into the historical side of things. Uh, but it's very, very important. I don't want to dismiss it. Uh, the problem is that historically, the philosophical conversation has been, uh, shall we say, steered in specific ways, you know, since the, uh, basically since feudalism started turning into the, the mainstream or the, the mass media version of feudalism, which occurred in the 20th century, basically, and now into the 21st century. So I want to talk about the trivium method, which uh, Jan Irvin at Gnostic Media goes into great length about. The trivium method consists of grammar, rhetoric, and logic. So grammar is the answering who, what, where, and when. Uh, basically looking at your, your historical facts and saying, you know, who did this? What did they do? Uh, logic is looking at how that happened. So, you know, the process there. And rhetoric is looking at why that happened. So that's where philosophy gets into it. It's like an interpretation of historical events. So you start with the historical data, and then you interpret it. If your historical data is flawed, then your interpretation can only be flawed. And that's the problem that we get into 
with a lot of people who are very interested in philosophy. Uh, it's a bit complicated, I'm not going to get into it any more than that, uh, but I do recommend Gnostic Media as a source and Jan Irvin's work. Uh, you know, he plays it, keeps his cards pretty close to his chest in terms of, you know, relying on data. Uh, so basically it's a question of motivation uh, for what you're going to spend your time doing on planet Earth as a human being. And if you enjoy having philosophical discussions, uh, that's basically what you're going to do. So if, you, if, if the, the thought of talking about these things and these motivations and why this kind of stuff happens like really jazzes you, you're not going to look back at the historical uh, foundations for having these discussions if they undermine your ability to have them. So, like, for example, if these philosophers that we're talking about were, like, I don't know, paid by somebody to write what they were writing, then that would be bad uh, for people who want to have those discussions based on what they're writing. So, uh, for example, from my life, I'm a musician. Uh, you know, basically musicians enjoy playing music. That's why they are musicians. And they're not going to go through life looking for things that are going to undermine their justification for playing music. So, like, for example, I play jazz music. Uh, the idea, the narrative in jazz music is that uh, bebop came about because white people went to Harlem and all the black jazz musicians were overwhelmed and marginalized, and they said to themselves, all right, we're going to make a music which is uh, hard to dance to, and it's hard to play, and that's going to give us back control over our music. And none of these people have any knowledge of the Income Tax Act of 1943, which put a 30% tax on, uh, on vocal music and on places where dancing would occur. And none of these people have any knowledge of the Petrillo band, uh, which made it literally illegal for musicians to record music at a very uh, seminal phase in the creation of bebop. So that's just one example that you don't get when you're, you know, quote unquote, following your muse, let's say. All right, so I'm gonna go into what I believe to be uh, the historical underpinnings for this kind of discussion we're having. And this comes basically from another thing that my friend posted on his Facebook page, which was that there is apparently a big link or a lot of similarities that he's seeing between the works of Nietzsche and Walt Whitman. And these people, as far as anyone can tell, n you know, never spoke to each other during their lifetimes. They didn't, you know, write back and forth or anything. Uh, so a big historical fact that may affect their similarities is that they are both Freemasons. All right, so they were both a part of this uh, secret society, um, you know, that was probably giving them money to do what they did. And so the power behind the throne, the man behind the curtain basically is saying, uh, came up with this idea, hey, if we can convince the intellectuals of this idea that God is passé, well, we're not going to have to vie with the church for their attention. So the, the church is going to go away, and they're going to be funneled into this uh, academic system, like universities and whatnot. And, you know, eventually the soft sciences, as they call them, social sciences, uh, sociology, anthropology, you know, all of which is uh, being controlled by us as well, but that's another story, okay? Uh, you know, now, at that point, it's very complicated. Uh, I was researching this. I couldn't find the smoking gun evidence for uh, Whitman being involved with the Freemasonry. I found a lot of stuff on Nietzsche, but if anyone wants to challenge me on that, if anyone wants me to make another video uh, talking about Walt Whitman and Freemasonry, I found a ton of circumstantial evidence, a ton of uh, institutional links. I'm very happy to do so. Just let me know in the comments section. Uh, so we've got these great quotes from our two gentlemen. Uh, Nietzsche, famous for saying, Gott ist tot, God is dead. Uh, Walt Whitman, 
for his part, said, Whatever satisfies the soul is truth. And now again, I'm not going to get into the whole drawn out history of this kind of stuff, but uh, later in history, we've got somebody saying, This uh, chestnut, do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. And that was, of course, uh, Aleister Crowley, who gave us uh, Thelema as that concept, so that's part of uh, some really gross stuff I want to get into. Uh, but so we've got a philosophical basis for why you shouldn't go to church, why you shouldn't have a uh, any kind of like a morality or an ethic, all coming out of basically the 18th and 19th centuries. Um, on the other hand, then, we have uh, the burdening science of psychology during the same time period, uh, which is telling us this idea that people are animals, people are a product of their environment, and this is, uh, you know, people like Pavlov with his dogs, uh, B.F. Skinner a little later, uh, but I think that, you know, the big thing to take away from the psychological message, or what they, what is basically encapsula encapsulated in the psychological uh, body, you know, corpus, is uh, that we need government intervention. And who controls the governments? Well, you know, we don't have to get into that, because I would... Yada, yada, yada. So, basically, what's happening is we've got, you know, one side is philosophy, the other side is science. They're both being controlled, and they're both leading to this idea that there is no such thing as God, that there is no such thing as morality, and people should just uh, focus on the temporal aspect of life. So I'm going to get into the esoteric a little bit, or my own personal take on the esoteric. I was sharing this with my lovely camera girl, and she got something out of it, so hopefully you will too. Um, basically I'm drawing on something called the Law of One, which was brought to us by people named Carla Ruckert, Don Elkins, and Jim McCarty. Unfortunately, only Jim McCarty is still alive, uh, but I want to give them a shout out, and their organization is called LL Research. Uh, they've given us a set of ideas called service to self and service to others. And basically, service to self can be thought of as selfishness, and service to others can be thought of as altruism, you know. So it makes sense. You're serving yourself with service to self. You're serving others you know, giving, putting energy out into the universe. And so I think it's really important to understand that basically when we throttle down the spiritual conversation, uh, that affects the service to others uh, way of being much more strongly than it affects service to self. Because service to, el service to self comes from uh, material reality. So like you can drink alcohol and feel good. You can have sex and have it feel good. You can have power over other people and it will feel good. And that is basically, that's something you can look at and, and understand pretty easily. That these are, these are you know, good things at least in, in the short term. And so I'm going to pursue them further. I don't need any kind of a book I don't need any kind of a revelation, uh, you know, to be persuaded that these are valid ways of being. So service to self, sorry, service to others, on the other hand, uh, where does that come from? Uh, I'm going to argue that basically it only comes uh, from faith. It comes from go getting together with people who do express who express this faith? That's called like a congregation. Uh, it comes from you know going before before your particular altar, you know, and and praying or meditating, whatever particular uh, individual uh, practice you have or you know ritual that you have. It doesn't have to be in like an organized church, uh, but the point is that this kind of stuff is a lot more tenuous than just getting drunk and saying, boy, I love getting drunk, or getting high and saying, boy, I love getting high, I'm going to do that. 
and you know when you lose the uh, the lineage, you know, the heritage of doing, of having this kind of a conversation, you lose a whole lot. Whereas, you know, a thousand years from now, some guy can just find a bottle of gin and cork it open and be like, that's great. Yeah, I don't need, I don't need any kind of like spiritual awakening to like getting drunk. That's self-evident. So I want to put it out to the universe here. What is happening to discourse? What is happening with conversation? So I said earlier that my friend and I were just not having the same conversation, which is why I'm making a YouTube video here, which I understand is not the most respectful thing to do to him. The most respectful thing would be to take the time to speak to him directly, but I feel like it, I'm not getting through. So here I am, and I'm sorry. I am sorry that I'm doing this, but hopefully someone other than just the two of us We'll get something out of that. So specifically, what he did, uh, you know, beyond having different conversations, is he did not even address my claims. So first of all, I made the claim that Ezra Klein, editor of Vox, got to where he is today by doing something nefarious. Now I don't have proof of that. I am simply inferring from the fact that Vox is not well written and does not um, provide news uh, in, that, in the context of every other media outlet being controlled or you know people getting where they are today through such a venue uh, you fill in the blanks there um, that's important uh, you know if you like something someone said and they're a terrible terrible person that doesn't mean that their point is invalid, but you know, if they're getting paid to write what they write, then that really, you know, that really says something. Um, you know, by the same token, just because someone's a Freemason, that doesn't mean they're a terrible person. I believe there's good Freemasons, there's good people working there, and if you are, you know, come and talk to me, and I'd love to, uh, you know, have a dialogue there with the good guys. Um, he didn't bring up the woozle effect, which is serious. Like, that is just a basic, basic academia. Um, so that's, that's a real big thing, too. You can't just ignore that and say, well, I think this is a good article. Uh, and I'm sharing the article in the comment, or in the uh, description down below, so go ahead and read it, and if you like it, if you think I missed something, or you have some evidence to back up what the article is stating, please do so. Um, he didn't address my two historical examples of the Stanford Prison Experiment and the Kinsey Accords, which I put a lot of work into. So that's just that, in my opinion. And basically, uh, you know, long story short, I feel like what's happening is he's being respectful. This whole dialogue was respectful, and yet we're at a point in our media where people are dying to bring us this information, okay? People are being murdered in the night, like the, uh, the DNC fellow. Uh, people's lives are being ruined. People's careers are being ruined. And to just, you know, cite a Vox article willy-nilly and if someone says, don't do that, and you say, no, I like it, so I'm going to do it, it's just, it's just disrespectful. It is disrespectful. I'm sorry. So that is basically all I had to say um, for this little video. I hope somebody out there got something out of it, and if you have anything you'd like me to address in the future, or any questions about this particular video, just leave me a comment below. Thank you very much. This has been Evan Benton of Evdog from Air.